speak at this house, Brother Skip Francis. I don't remember when I first uh, became acquainted with uh, Skip by name, but uh, sometime a few years ago, I began seeing his name in connection with some uh, articles that were written, some things of that kind, and began to admire what I saw from him and uh, had an opportunity to get a little better acquainted with him uh, oh three or four years ago I don't remember just how long ago now through his uh, suggestion I'm sure I was invited to preach in a meeting where he is the pastor no he's a pastor I'm sorry he's one of the pastors and the preacher just to make that perfectly clear <laughs> But he arranged to be out of town the entire time of the gospel meeting. <laughs> I think he didn't make it back Wednesday night. The meeting started on Sunday morning. Uh, actually, he was not out of town all the time. He made it for Saturday night supper before the meeting started. <laughs> there is a story behind that. But Skip uh, has been in Sulphur, Virginia. I think that's what, Tidewater area? Is that what they call it? and that's pretty close to where Daniel Denham and his family live and work and uh, has been there several years now doing a very good work there good sound congregation there and uh, those of us who are on some of the uh, Brotherhood internet lists uh, uh, know Skip's capabilities if we didn't know it from any other source from the wonderful posts that he puts on the list and he has a good, clear, logical mind, deep conviction in the scriptures. And uh, we're in for a very fine exercise in the study of God's word and sacrament. Let's get the coverage. I guess as we often do when we participate in these events, I want to take a moment or two to thank the Spring Elders for inviting me as well as Brother David Brown. It's an honor to be here and especially on such a timely and important topic as the subject of unity in today's church. But I want to give a special thanks to Brother and Sister Cohn for putting me up and putting up with me. That's no mean task because we we were able to spend a couple of weeks together at the English lectures and kind of travel all over England together. So the fact that they put up with me knowing how I am is a pretty incredible thing. One of the things that I strove to do in the manuscript was to address how the world sometimes affects the church. And of course, I had a section in there on how the church was affected by slavery in the Civil War. Today, the church is affected by ecumenism, humanism, evolution, postmodernism, and what they're now calling neoconservatism. In politics, the neoconservatives say that they are compassionate conservatives, and of course, by implication, that means that conservatives are not inherently compassionate. I wish some of them would have read Barry Goldwater's book. Uh, the conscience of a conservative. They also compromise their principles by doing what they call reaching across the aisle. And you wonder, you wonder how just, just how far they're willing to reach across that aisle when you see some of the things they're involved in. The religious neocons say that they are balanced, as though conservatives are not balanced and are willing to compromise fellowship. Of course, my question is, why reach across the aisle? Why compromise the truth? In politics, why call yourself a Republican and stand opposed to half the party platform? In the church, why call yourself sound or conservative while not preaching the whole counsel of God? while avoiding all of the current issues and while not practicing what you preach. You know, the first question that I had to ask myself about this lectureship was, how do I condense a 46-page manuscript into a half-hour lecture? 
Well, there were two possible answers to that. First, I could either rewrite the entire thing, or second, I could give a simplified answer to the question, is the church in crisis? Absolutely. The church has been in crisis since its very foundation. And it was predicted by the Lord that it would be so while the church itself was still being built. But since I agreed to a half-hour lecture, I'm going to ask you to read the manuscript while I pare down my remarks to a size more suitable to this time frame. Unless, of course, I want to use some of that Mon Pa Kettle math. <laughs> or, or maybe the time and schedule that Brother Blake used. How would we define a crisis? There are several synonyms for crisis. A catastrophe, a predicament, a disaster, a calamity. Dictionary definitions include a dangerous or worrying time, critical moment, and a turning point in disease. The question is, is the church in crisis? It's safe to say that the church, at least in this country, is in a grave predicament. It is a dangerous and worrying time, a critical moment, and in some cases, the turning point in spiritual disease. Paul wrote, for this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep, 1 Corinthians 11.30. As has been said, this is not a test. It is an actual emergency. You know, in one of my very first attempts at writing anything for the church, I set out to edit, edit a little quarterly for the local area churches. And my very first editorial was entitled, What's Your Sign? Now, of course, this was a, a little kind of a takeoff on the subject of astrology, but it was designed to illustrate how congregations that had left the faith still maintained by virtue of their church signs an affiliation with the Church of Christ. There are many today that fall into this category who now believe that the gospel of Christ is not sufficient and have added to their worship and practice that for which there is no Bible authority. This includes all of you children's churchers, you lads to leaders, you disaster reliefists. It includes all praise teamsters, winter festians, and small groupers. Why do you still list Church of Christ anywhere on your sign? It is plain that you are no longer a Church of Christ, at least in any biblical sense. We have a case in point in Tidewater, Virginia. In the city of Chesapeake, the congregation was once considered a faithful body of the Lord's Church. The Providence Road Church is a study in digression. This congregation entered the slippery slope when they began to use men like Carol Osborne as a regular speaker at several seminars, as they called them. At the time, Brother Osborne was a faculty member of Abilene Christian University and a noted and admitted change agent. Of course, you can read the full account in the manuscript. Shortly after my arrival in Virginia, nearly six years ago, I was told by the Suffolk elders that we had nothing to do with the Providence Road congregation, due in part to their having hosted a meeting with Jeff Wallach. Now, back in the early 1990s, when it became known that Providence Road was sponsoring Jeff Walling, Brother Danny Douglas, who was preaching for the Portsmouth, Virginia congregation, confronted the Providence Road elders and their preacher, Bobby Clark, over the matter. He brought documents and tapes of Walling's errors. And as he reported to me, he said, Bobby Clark kept stopping the tape of Walling's sermon that we were attempting to listen to. In other words, we got nowhere with them. Several other congregations in the area also opposed this meeting with Jeff Walling. Digression in our area became a lot more obvious when we as a congregation began to evaluate our participation in the local Christian camp. This had been donated to the Churches of Christ in our area many years earlier. But we began to notice that most of the participants and supporters were of the ultra-liberal persuasion of those in Tidewater, Virginia. Circumstances ended up forcing us to issue a circular letter to the area explaining why we would no longer support the camp. 
we put these congregations in that letter on notice that we could not, would not continue to support, jointly participate with, or fellowship any person or group that supports and upholds false teachers, ascribes to unscriptural practices, or goes beyond the authority of the Bible in any way. Shortly after our letter was circulated, I became aware of efforts being made by the Newport News congregation and Brother Daniel Denham to contact digressive congregations in Tidewater, Virginia, with an effort, of course, to bring about their repentance. That's really the desire of, of, of those in the faith that look at these things and are concerned about them. We want to maintain unity. We want to maintain fellowship. But after nearly a full year of efforts, the Providence Road congregation, along with four others in the area, received notification that they were being withdrawn from first by the Newport News Church, and then, of course, our congregation followed suit because they were endorsing false teachers. They were using the children's church program, endorsing denominational practices and works, hand clapping and other such practices, which were individually reason enough for withdrawal, but added up to overwhelming evidence. Now, since then, the Providence Road Church has relegated the Church of Christ to a subtext on their side. They're now a Church of Christ instead of the Church of Christ. They began a seeker service. Now, that's one of those denominational terms been floating around for several years. On Saturday afternoons, that consisted of electronically enhanced rock-style music, complete with guitars, drums, and other instruments of music, which played so-called Christian rock backed up by a light show and all the entertainment accoutrements involved. It was not long before this self-built change point service replaced Sunday evening worship service. So now they can rock and roll instead of reverently worship the Lord. Most recently, prompting a full page ad in the local newspaper, they held a party at which dancing was a big part. The newspaper article called this event Party in the Pulpit and said it was allegedly based on biblical principles. The article referred to them as a Church of Christ congregation. Now, I, for one, was appalled that the Bride of Christ was mentioned in the article at all. Under another heading entitled Moved by the Spirit, it said, a conga line, the electric slide, the cha-cha slide, and we may have even danced the Macarena. In other words, they were saying that they danced lasciviously as they were moved by the Spirit. We cannot help but notice the seeds of change agency and how they've affected the church and how such is a historic problem a problem that has continued since the very infancy of the Lord's Church. In the manuscript, I mentioned several such incidents over a period of the last 150 years or so, but these are just the tip of the iceberg. Most of the recent issues involve those that are following the pattern of W. Carl Ketcherson, a former proponent of anti-ism, he became the champion of the notion of unity and diversity. Of course, Brother Brown rightly called it in his speech, union in diversity. Along with his close friend and cohort, Leroy Garrett, Carl Ketcher's side has done more for the cause of change agency than any other man in the past generation. After having had this emotional epiphany in Ireland in 1951, Carl describes the years 1953 to 1957 as years of change. Now, that's a correct assessment. And it became evident to the world in 1957. One of my fellow elders in Suffolk, Brother Jake Thacker, often says, if a man believes something, he'll teach it. Well, that's what Carl began to do in 57 with an article titled that they all may be one. And this was closely followed by Another article, Thoughts on Fellowship, in January of 1958. Now, Brother Dub Mallory mentioned some of this this morning. 
In both of these articles, the seeds of unity and diversity were sown. Now, Carl referred to his change as crossing the Rubicon. Now, that's an appropriate statement for what actually took place. For those of you that don't know, the Rubicon is a river that borders Rome. And just as many people have done before him and since, Carl Ketcherside left Babylon in order to go to Jerusalem only to end up in Rome. In other words, he left one extreme to end up in another. It's just as sinful to lose where the Bible does not lose as it is to bind where the Bible does not bind. These are the two extremes to which Carl went in his spiritual life. He went directly from anti-ism to liberalism. Again, as my friend Jake Packer says, Carl Ketcher's side has been on the wrong side of every issue in the Brotherhood. And that's true. But you know, one of the things that we can do by examining what Brother Ketcher's side did is we can look at the pattern that he established in the evolution of digression. There are four major areas in which digression frequently occurs as the unity and diversity crowd do. First, they begin to fellowship with error. Second, they start to attack those that are opposed to such fellowship. Third, they mischaracterize the entire problem. And fourth, they end up embracing the error itself. These were Carl Ketcherside's tactics, and those that came after him have followed suit. His initial forays into unity and diversity were most prevalent in his acceptance of the Christian church into his fellowship. And of course, that's been discussed at some length earlier today. But others of his progeny are still doing it. The Christian Chronicle reported on August 1, 2006, that a number of folks from the, and I use the quotations, Church of Christ, I use them loosely because they use them loosely, including Marvin Phillips and Jerry Taylor, ACU President Royce Money, and Rochester College President Mike Westerfield attended the North American Christian Convention. This convention is designed to foster improved relations between Churches of Christ and the Christian Church. At the convention, Jeff Walling presented a Bible that had been given to him in memory of his late father to Dave Stone, minister of the Southeast Christian Church in Louisville. He told Mr. Stone at the time, I want to tell you tonight, you are my brother. Now, this wasn't new with Jeff. It was Jeff Walling who said, at the 15th Annual Tulsa International Soul Winning Workshop during his speech on the subject of John 17, that they all may be one. In order to preach the text, we can't get into this lesson without appreciating the fact that Jesus asked that we would throw the calf rope around all of those who just believe in him and pray and work for the unity of believers. Now, in this statement, Jeff Walling proves that you can give a man enough calf rope, he'll hang himself. But Jeff Walling had many fellow travelers over the years. You know, we, we've become familiar with Rubel Shelley, Lynn Anderson, and Max Licato. If these were all that fell into this category, it would be enough to say that the church is definitely in crisis. Since we've had many years of dealing with these folks and their cohorts, it's no great surprise when they up the ante and do something even more outrageous than before. The real question we have to deal with, however, concerns the new sons of Ketcherside, who are using the same tactics while still maintaining the facade of soundness in the faith. It's also interesting to note not only the concerns of fellowship, with the Christian church, but also all the lessons 
that many of our progressive and neo-progressive brethren have learned from that. Today, we seem to have moved from being lovers of the church to being lovers of the parachurch organization. Back in the 1850s, brethren tried to hand over their mission work to an organization known as the American Christian Missionary Society. The church today has opted for many such groups to do the work that's already been assigned by God to the family and to the church. Like so many in the current parachurch movement, being entirely of human origin, the American Christian Missionary Society had no authority from Scripture in favor of either its organization or its work. But as has often happened with such issues, both before and since, brethren have failed to exercise due caution and test all things, hold fast what is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Paul wrote, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians 3.17 When you do something in the name of the Lord, you're doing it with his authority. If there's no authority for it, you don't do it. I served in the United States Air Force for 21 years. We knew you didn't do anything you didn't have a record for. Why the church can't seem to understand that today is beyond me. Churches of Christ, Disaster Relief Enterprises, Inc. is one such organization. Now I want you to notice that the first thing they do is seek to identify with the church. Yet they are not the church. They're not part of the church by organization, by preaching, by teaching, or by worship. Second, they're not overseen by any eldership. In fact, they have a board of directors, an advisory board, a president, a vice president, and 11 paid employees. Third, they solicit funds in unscriptural ways. They advertise a CD produced by the Jordanaires. Many, many of you remember that. That was the backup group for Elvis Presley. As well as several other methods that they use to contribute to their effort with those all too familiar credit card logos on their website. Fourth, they boast of receiving funds from those other than Churches of Christ, identified merely as churches. The only conclusion we can come to is that these are denominational groups. In addition, they receive donations from various corporate entities. This places them into the realm of fellowship with many with whom we should not be in fellowship. Which, by the way, is another consistent problem with these parachurch groups. Notice that Paul wrote, moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the administering of the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1 to 5. The church is nowhere authorized to solicit funds from non-Christians, corporate entities, or denominational groups, nor is it authorized to fundraise by offering any services for funds. Now, all of that said, that's completely disregarding that the fact that the work they do is not authorized in the Scriptures. Similar to the CCDRE is the organization known as Lads to Leaders, Leaderettes. Now, many have sought to compare that with the old Timothy classes or preacher boy training, but it's not. Besides other obvious problems, they involve folks in sinful fellowship. 
congregations that may not be in fellowship with one another locally may in fact be in fellowship at a last the leaders convention many of the congregations that are involved in last the leaders practice error of one form or another but the last the leaders folks don't seem to have practiced first john 4 1 either now by way of explaining that and showing that I mentioned that we had withdrawn from five congregations in our area. Well, one of those congregations has begun advertising Lats to Leaders in just the past year. When it's evident that they're practicing sinful things. Like the CCDRE, Lats to Leaders is not the church. In fact, they tell you this on their webpage. Well, I have a question for them. If you are not the church as you claim, why do you have worship services that are held at your convention hall? Why do you take up a collection at said worship services and keep the funds for lads to leaders? According to the scriptures, the collection that is commanded on the first day of the week is a collection for the saints. 1 Corinthians 16.1. It's later called ministering to the saints in 2 Corinthians 9.1. The term the saints refers to the church. If lads to leaders is not the church, then by what authority do they take up a free will offering? Now I've attended other venues over the years where I've been gathered together with other Christians on the first day of the week. Arrangements were always made for us to worship at the sponsoring congregation or one that was nearby. Men who are being touted as sound in the faith today have no problem whatever being actively involved with CCDRE and Lads to Leaders, as well as practicing these children's worship, children's church functions. Men like Gary Hampton, the new director of East Tennessee School of Preaching, and Phil Sanders, staff writer for The Spiritual Sword, come to mind immediately. Unfortunately, the church has many new sons of Ketcherson, those that practice fellowship with error, attack those who oppose the error, mischaracterize the entire circumstance in order to cloud the issue, and will ultimately embrace the error of themselves. One error that is, at, is literally at the heart of the current crisis in the church is that of Dave Miller, who taught the unscriptural and unauthorized practice of elder reevaluation and reaffirmation, as well as the so-called marriage intent doctrine, which would allow someone to defraud the government in, in, in having one of these green card marriages and then simply divorce and remarry. Dave is where the error lies, but we're talking about those that fellowship him and his error. Many former pillars of the church are now in Dave Miller's camp and continue to practice open fellowship with him, even though adequate evidence of Dave's error has been provided to them. Further, they are now in the second and third stages of catechism, in that they are now attacking those who oppose the error and mischaracterizing the entire situation. Now, I want to talk about those attacks for a minute. You know, we've tried to maintain that old alligator skin that preachers are supposed to have. When Joseph Metter said we were in a toxic loyalty circle, we all joked about it. We had many laugh over the terms. I remember even telling Doug McLeish one day, have you ever noticed that the initials aren't TLC? <laughs> when folks like Chad Dallahite and Roger Jackson told us that we were caustic, unfriendly, or mean, we just shook our heads and smiled and tried to understand why they just didn't get it. When we were told we were grumpy old men, we all poked fun at one another as to who was the grumpiest or oldest among us. I think we concluded that the oldest in our midst was Daniel Denham's hair. 
I think Dub's following him pretty close to that. So. Brethren, many of these terms and issues may be amusing, but it ceases to be funny when a once respected pillar of the church uses terms like vile and liars to refer to you and those you associate with. That's not funny. Sadly, this was done without providing even one scrap of evidence that a lie was ever told. An allegation is merely an assertion unless there is proof. Now, those of you that have followed my writings on the Internet list know that one of my favorite things to do when people make allegations is to say the same thing. You know what it is. Prove it. Where's the proof? They can stand and say it, but it doesn't make it true without proof. This seems to be the mindset that so many have today in their attempts to deal with the facts. Recently on the CFTF internet list, Cole Satterfield entered a discussion about the Lads to Leaders organization. And he tried to defend it on the basis of a subjective understanding of the scriptures. And I know Daniel Denham spent a fair amount of time refuting him. After several days of the discussion, when it became apparent that he had no defense, he left the list and said, I have been greeted with slander and caustic remarks. Now, several attempts were made to determine what slander was ever used or what caustic remark was ever made, even by those who hadn't even been involved in the discussion. But he wouldn't answer, nor would he provide any proof. This seems to be the methodology of those who have no other defense. You know, it's kind of like the old liberal formula. If the truth works, use the truth. If the law works, use the law. If all else fails, attack the person. The remarks of Keith Mosher, as he was asked about the elder r, &R doctrine at the West Kentucky Lectures, were only the tip of the iceberg. As he referred to those in opposition to the elder R&R &R doctrine and Dave Miller as vile, and he went on to say, and I do mean vile, he was joined by Curtis Gates, Glenn Colley, B.J. Clark, and others, who just added to the situation. Not one of them took issue with the comment that he had made about former brethren in Christ. In fact, they all added fuel to the fire. B.J. Clark accused us of not investigating the evidence concerning Miller. The fact is that a CD produced by Michael Hatcher and, and, and now being distributed by Brother Brown containing over 140 pages of printed material has been available for months. And it's condemning material. It is B.J. that has not looked to see if it is a thing certain. Keith Mosher also said we were trying to destroy about nine good brotherhood works. Well, you know, first, most of the works that he's, he's referring to amount to parachurch groups of human origin. Thus, it can't be rightly said that they are brotherhood works, save in the fact that brethren are involved in them. Second, they are only good if they continue to meet the scriptural criteria for goodness. I'd say that fellowship with error would disqualify them from that. Now, one of the more interesting things that was said at the West Kentucky Lectures came from Charles Leonard. Now, I'm certain that he was speaking about something entirely different than the, que than the situation in question. In fact, he has said as much since. I wonder if the men on that day were squirming in their seats. They should have been when he said that there were some brethren who simply would not meet. All the key players involved in the Memphis School of Preaching, Apologetics Press, Gospel Broadcast Network, and others were invited to the 2006 Contending for the Faith Lectures Open Forum right here. But none came. They were invited in 2007 my brother Broking and others to the Mountain City, Tennessee Church Unity Forum, along with local preacher Wesley Simon, who I might add is seeking the destruction of Brother Broking and his congregation. But none came. 
They were even invited by Brother Lynn Parker to meet in the Forest Hill Church building or anywhere else they chose in any format of their own design as long as it was taped for all the brethren to have access to. Now that request was made in April of 2007 and it has never been responded to. Who is it that is not meeting? In the September-October 2007 issue of Yoke Fellow, the publishing arm of Memphis School of Preaching, Bobby Liddell, the school's new director, wrote an editorial entitled, Love Your Enemies. But there wasn't a lot of love in that editorial. He went to great lengths to address these issues while never naming who he was talking about or what he was talking about. As has been said numerous times, however, implication is a difficult thing. When one speaks within a certain time frame or concerning, uh, concerning a certain subject matter, who they're talking about does become evident. In that editorial, he had some obvious targets in mind, especially when you consider the fact that Memphis has been a part, a great part, of the current controversy over Dave Miller. Brother Liddell wrote, we are to pray for those who maliciously allege, falsely accuse, hatefully slander, and knowingly bear false witness in an attempt to bring harm to us, to ruin our reputations, to encourage others to shun us, or who would encourage others to join with them in their dishonest and unethical denunciations and persecutions of us. It's evident in the context of current events that Brother Liddell is making reference to those of us who oppose Memphis and their fellowship with Dave Miller. While couching all of this in the phraseology of being loving, he implies malice, lying, hate, false witness to his opposers. He also implies a number of problems of the heart when he suggests the purpose behind all this that has never been the reason or rationale for such opposition. He says we want to ruin reputations and encourage others to shun them or encourage others to be dishonest and unethical. How far from the mark such a statement is? Everyone here wishes we could go back to the time when Memphis School of Preaching was considered one of the few places worthy to train preachers in our time. Now, there's a, a part of this statement that I took personally to heart. Because he followed by saying many attacks are nothing more than calculated displays designed to parade the strong stand one is supposedly taking for the truth. The goal some seek to accomplish is of such importance to them that they can, with assumed impunity, do wrong to achieve it. Sadly, others perceiving an opportunity to make a name or to, or to secure an invitation jump on the bandwagon and ignorantly serve evil purpose. First, is it wrong to take a strong stand for the truth? Who is really ignoring the truth when they disregard volumes of written evidence? The statement that I took particular umbrage with was the implication that I or others have jumped on a bandwagon and are merely trying to make a name for ourselves or secure an invitation to the big lectures. I particularly didn't like the part about ignorantly serving evil purposes. This assumes that we're just ignorant followers of men Ditto heads. Unable to think for ourselves with no ability at all to look at and examine evidence. You know, as, as Brother McClish alluded to earlier, I've only met Brother McClish and Brother Brown over the past three years or so. And last year I stated that I was the new guy here. I guess I might be perceived as one of these brethren that was seeking an invitation. Brethren, if a brother's word means anything, I can state uncategorically for myself, please, that it's my fondest desire that such an opportunity never existed. What we have is a classic example of the scientific principle that nature abhors a vacuum. You know, in football, it's the job of the offensive line to open up a hole for the defense 
in the defense for the running back to go through. But it's the defensive line's job, and the defensive linebacker in particular, to plug that hole. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Ezekiel 22:30. Those that seem to be pillars will not take a stand against error. It's up to those who will to stand in the gap. The church of our Lord is going through another crisis as we speak. It is a dangerous or worrying time, a critical moment, and a turning point in spiritual disease. The malaise is one that has been a recurrent theme in the scriptures. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria. Notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to Calne and see, and from there go to Hamath the Great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who cause the seat of violence to come near, who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David. Amos 6, 1 through 5. It's very brave of the likes of Mosher, Cates, Clark, and Colley, not to mention Simons and others, to stand and speak when they are amongst those of like mind. It's another thing for them to have to defend the things they do and say when confronted by their accusers. As I stated earlier, they just will not meet. They desire no public forum where they are required to answer. Is Keith Mosher here today? Curtis Gates? Dave Miller? Glenn Collett? Those that actively support Gospel Broadcast Network? Where are they? It is past time for those that are at ease in Zion to get up off the, their beds of ivory, leave the hallowed halls of academia, put behind them their little star chambers and kangaroo courts, and prove their allegations against those they once called brethren, but are now simply vile liars to them. Don't continue to put far off the, excuse me, the day of doom by crying peace, peace when there is no peace. One of Curtis Kate's followers told me that Curtis and his elders had decided they should just let sleeping dogs lie. Perhaps they haven't noticed. This dog is not asleep. The dog of wrongful fellowship is a spiritual pit bull that will not go away. I've lived in the South for nearly six years, and I've learned a few Southern expressions along the way. The one that comes to mind regarding this particular pit bull of wrongful fellowship that so many of our brethren are currently embracing is, that dog won't hunt. The Church of our Lord is in crisis, there's no question. It can be resolved. If only brethren will meet and reason together. If such does not happen, the church will survive. Nonetheless, as long as good men continue to stand for the truth, who will stand in the gap? Thank you.